Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Tough Targets, Simple Genotyping, Complete Solutions for Mitochondrial Disease, CRISPR, Pharmacogenetics, and Neuroscience Research, presented by Dana Sullivan, a product manager at Canon Biomedical. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Canon Biomedical. For more information about our sponsor, visit www.canonbiomedical.com. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appear on the screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, notice you're viewing the presentation in a slide window. Just click on that screen icon located at the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use that Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. Good news, this presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left-hand corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me now in welcoming Dana Sullivan, a presenter. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Dana. Thank you, Susie, and thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you for joining me today. Today I'm excited to present on Tough Targets Simple Genotyping, Complete Solutions for Mitochondrial Disease, CRISPR, Pharmacogenetics, and Neuroscience. Before I start, I do have to share some disclaimers. So all of the products I'm discussing today are for research use only. They're not for use in diagnostic procedures. You can find licensing information and user guides on our website. Um, Canon Biomedical products are available in the United States direct from Canon Biomedical, and we have distributors throughout Europe and in Canada. And lastly, Novoil is a trademark of Canon Biomedical. Here is just a quick agenda slide of the topics I'll be going over today. Let's get started with Canon and genetics, as I am sure not all of you know that Canon has entered into this field. For those of you who aren't aware of Canon Biomedical, you may be wondering why we are presenting here at LabRoots. You may also be wondering if we are related to the Canon who offers cameras and printers. Well, the short answer is yes, we are the same. However, we are a smaller subsidiary of that larger parent company. The next question you may have is, what do you do? Do you offer microscopes for my cam or cameras for my microscopes or some sort of medical imaging? Well, the answer here is no, but today I will discuss what we do offer. As I mentioned, Canon Biomedical is a newer subsidiary of Canon. The company was launched in March of 2015. However, biomedical products aren't completely new to Canon. In fact, our first president was a medical doctor who developed imaging technologies to, to help aid in the diagnosis of active tuberculosis in the Japanese population. Since then, Canon has always been interested in serving the medical, healthcare, and research community. So in 2015, they launched a specific company dedicated to the biomedical field. Canon Biomedical's goal is to focus on products for life science researchers and molecular diagnostics. And in September of that same year, we launched our first commercial life science product, products. These are research use only, novel genotyping assays, which I will discuss in more detail today. For the rest of this presentation, I would like to focus on the different applications of where the novel genotyping reagents can help you in your research. I think it's easy to agree that there are many things that you often consider when you need to genotype a sample, and there are different situations where genotyping may be required. On this section on the right, you will see three of these situations where you often have a need to genotype samples. The first situation is a pre-screen. So maybe you are selecting a sample to include or exclude from a larger study. 
The second is a screen, which is a more retrospective approach. A good example of this might be screening CRISPR clones for a specific mutation. And then lastly, you could be genotyping to verify something that you already learned from a different method or was unclear from a different method. So for example, maybe you send out samples for full genome sequencing and you need to verify a rare or difficult to genotype target that came back as indeterminate. Depending on the type of variation or variations you are investigating, you will need to choose a specific technology. And as we know, there are many types of mutations, some of which you can see on the slide here, such as SNPs, somatic mutations, insertions, deletions, duplications, even something more complicated like copy number variations. But while those are the needs you may have as a receipt a researcher, you do have options. One of the options you face is which technology should you use. There are many options, starting with some simple and more targeted approaches like Sanger sequencing or PCR-based based methods. And then there are more complicated methods like next generation sequencing that is a more full genome approach. And so when choosing an option or technology, I think it's fair to say that you often have to consider the specific experiment or project you are working on. For example, are you trying to discover new mutations and perhaps looking for the unknown, or are you testing for a specific mutation? Sample number and sample amount can also weigh on what sort of technology you want to choose and lastly, you may consider your resources. Not just the amount of people or technicians you have and their skill sets available, but also budget and costs towards your genotyping effort. For example, do you want them to spend their time on genotyping methodology that requires a robust knowledge of bioinformatics analysis? Or would you rather those resources be applied elsewhere? Time could be of essence, so how quickly do you need the answer? Are you willing to wait to send out for a result, or do you need it right away, and do you have those resources to do it in-house? And so after you weigh these questions, you can choose a technology that fits your need. High resolution melting is a more targeted approach. It offers a broad selection of targets. It can detect what might be considered tough or difficult targets. It allows you to test one sample at a time and still be accurately able to call a genotype. This is not always the case in other targeted methods like hydrolysis probe PCR, for example. You can also distinguish multiple SNPs or indels in one gene using HRM. And the technology is cost effective and fast in fact, in most cases, it can be run within an hour and sometimes less, and it can be run on an open platform. The data analysis is scalable, and it can be very straightforward due to the availability of controls. Because of these advantages that HRM offers, Canon Biomedical uses technology to develop and launch the novial genotyping assays. These assays have a very simple four-step protocol, the first step being DNA extraction, followed by sample preparation, which requires mixing the assay, sample, or control with our high-speed novial genotyping master mix. Next is to run those reactions on an instrument with fluorescent detection that supports HRM. Most real-time PCR instruments have HRM capability. I will be providing examples of those towards the end of this presentation. Finally, the last step is to analyze the data. We offer Novial control sets that make analysis even easier. They allow you to compare your sample melt curves to characterize genotyping controls to easily call the sample genotype. In addition, most instruments support HRM analysis. However, if you don't have the software packages to analyze your data, we do offer free HRM software that is accessible online. 
HRM can be used to detect a variety of different mutations. Our novial assays detect SNPs, small insertions and deletions. And so what I mean by that are those that are less than six base pairs. Mitochondrial DNA targets, which I will discuss in a few slides. And unlike hydrolysis probe PCR, HRM can detect much larger deletions, so those that are greater than 200 base pairs. And we even offer some assays that, de that detect over 7.5 kilobases. We also offer copy number assays that use HRM. As I mentioned, we offer genotyping controls with our novial assays. These are characterized wild type and homozygous mutant controls. The set can be combined to create a heterozygous control as well and is used to identify sample genotypes by comparing melt curves. So let's get into the applications. The first one being mitochondrial DNA detection. Due to the differences between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA, detecting mitochondrial DNA mutations is not as easy as detecting nuclear DNA mutations. While there are two copies of nuclear DNA, there are greater than 1,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited and has a much higher mutation rate. In fact, 10 to 17 fold higher than nuclear DNA. And more than 250 pathogenic mitochondrial DNA mutations have been identified. Mitochondria are the energy factory of our body. Several thousand mitochondria are in nearly every cell in our body. And when mutations occur, mitochondria can fail to produce enough energy, which can cause disorder or mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial diseases can be present at birth, but can also occur at any age. They can affect almost any part of our body, including the cells of our brain, nerves, muscles, and kidneys. One in 5,000 individuals has a mitochondrial disease, and each year, about 1,000 to 4,000 children in the United States are born with a mitochondrial disease. Known examples of mitochondrial disease caused by SNP mutations include Leber's disease, Maylas syndrome, and myoclonic epilepsy and ragged red fiber disease. Symptoms of these diseases can be found on this slide. But there are often neurological problems, such as dementia or muscle weakness and pain. So due to the commonality in symptoms, it's hard to distinguish and diagnose based on phenotype alone. Mitochondria are derived from the ovum, and the mitochondrial DNA is therefore maternally inherited. A mother carrying abnormal mitochondria will pass the abnormal mitochondria to all of her children, but only her female offspring will transmit the abnormal mitochondria to future generations. Affected males do not pass on the abnormal mitochondria. However, both sexes can suffer from mitochondrial disease. Detecting mitochondrial DNA becomes even more complicated due to the heteroplasmic nature of the mitochondria genome. So at birth, usually all mitochondria of an individual are identical. This is known as homoplasmy. However, as individuals grow and the cells begin to replicate, mutations can occur at random during the cellular replication processes. This results in what's called heteroplasmy which is the occurrence of more than one type of mitochondrial DNA. When a cell has only a few mitochondria with mutant mitochondria DNA, the cell can function normally. However, if most of the mitochondria are mutant, then the cell function is most likely severely altered, and an altered phenotype can be observed. In the presence of heteroplasmy, the ratio of wild type to mutant mitochondrial DNA can determine the onset of clinical symptoms. 
a minimum critical proportion of mutated mitochondrial DNA is necessary before biochemical defects and tissue dysfunction become apparent. Canon Biomedical has developed HRM-based assays that target specific pathogenic mutations in the mitochondrial genome that are associated with some of the more common mitochondrial diseases. These are the ones I spoke about earlier, so MRF, MILF, and LHON. And their associated diseases can be found in the far right column on the slide seen here. Common detection methods for these targets, like NGS or Sanger sequencing, can be costly and time-consuming. Our published research has found that HRM mitochondrial DNA, DNA detection is as, is as sensitive as these common methods, and the assays are able to detect mutations at a heteroplasmic population and so therefore, these assays are a viable alternative to other more costly labor-intensive options. This is one example of the data from a MALAS assay. The MALAS assay detects a mutation in the MTL1 gene. This condition affects many of the body systems, particularly the brain and the nervous system. The signs and symptoms of this disorder most often appear in childhood following a period of normal development, although they can begin at any age. And most affected individuals experience stroke-like episodes beginning bef before the age of 40. This assay here is an unlabeled probe assay. So there is a, t a tall peak on the far right that represents the full-size amplicon and a smaller peak to its left that represents the probe amplicon heteroduplex, where the SNP is present in the DNA. These smaller curves distinguish the three genotypes. Here you can see that wild type is in black, the homozygous mutant is in red, and the heterozygous genotype is in blue. This is an example of another mitochondrial target that we offer. This assay is a small amplicon assay, so it generates one peak that distinguishes the genotype. It detects a SNP in the MTND4 gene, which is associated with Leber's disease. Symptoms of this disease include vision loss that often occur in a person's teens or 20s. I mentioned heteroplasmy before, but, but detecting mitochondrial DNA becomes even more complicated due to the heteroplasmic nature of the mitochondrial genome. It is very possible for only some of the mitochondria to have a mutation, and you want to be able to detect that mutation. Our research has found that the assays we offer can detect mitochondrial DNA mutations between 9 and 13% mutant DNA depending on the mutation, and therefore can detect mutations even in a heteroplasmic population where only a portion of the mitochondria contain that mutation. The second application I would like to discuss is related to CRISPR, more specifically using HRM to screen CRISPR-derived edits. I'm sure we can all agree that CRISPR is a pretty hot topic. As I'm sure you are aware, CRISPR is a somewhat newer, simpler technology often used for genome editing, and it does create genetic variants. However, for background purposes, CRISPR does have two main components, one being guide RNA and the other being DNA endonuclease uh, Cas9. The guide RNA determines where insertions or deletions may occur and directs Cas9 to bind to that area. Cas9 will then break the double-stranded DNA and repair the break one of two ways. Those repair mechanisms can be seen here. The break can be repaired by non-homologous end joining or homology-directed repair. Non-homologous end joining can produce insertions or deletions of variable lengths 
and is a much more random repair process, whereas homology directed repair has the ability to be more specific. It, it, it introduces precise point mutations or insertions by way of a donor template, which you can see here on the right. The two mechanisms for CRISPR repair can create challenges for gene editing, and when creating CRISPR clones, this can be an issue. Therefore, researchers need to screen the clone population to see which ones acquired the mutation or variation of interest. So due to the two repair mechanisms, not all clones will have a specific mutation. So the screening helps determine those that successfully inherited the mutation. There are limited downstream screening options for CRISPR clones. Because CRISPR is introducing genetic variation, genotyping techniques are often implemented into the screening process. Current methods include gel-based cleavage kits. However, this can be considered slow, they lack sensitivity, and they are very hands-on. Another option is self-primer design or nested PCR. So this requires significant expertise and can be time consuming due to the need of optimization. And then you can always use Sanger sequencing or NGS. However, this can take time. It often requires the samples to be sent out and it is more costly than the other two options. But what about HRM? As we've discussed, it is a useful way for detecting genetic variants. And as it turns out, Scientists have accepted HRM as a simple and effective way to screen for CRISPR-derived mutations. In fact, a group from Harvard recently published a protocol in Cold Spring Harbor Protocols on how to use HRM for detecting indel mutations caused by CRISPR. HRM can be used for initial screening of early clone generations, and it limits sequencing at each step. It is a cheaper option and also reduces sample preparation costs, and it can detect rare mutations and complex mutations that arise from gene editing. If you compare HRM to other methods, it does compare favorably, especially in time, cost, skills needed, and sensitivity. One group from University of Alabama recently published a study that found that HRM was highly efficient at detecting CRISPR-derived mutations in zebrafish. The group used HRM for rapid and efficient identification of nuclease-derived mutations to help advance cost-effective, high-throughput methodologies for mutation detection. In this chart, they break down the results from their HRM analysis on four different CRISPR-targeted genes and show that HRM was able to detect all cells with a derived mutation 100% of the time. You may be wondering what this workflow or protocol looks like. After identifying the target and receiving the designed guide RNA, you can prepare a culture of the cells and deliver the Cas9 and the guide RNA by one of two options, so either through a plasmid or as is. And if you are trying to repair the cells by inserting a specific mutation, you will want to include a donor template to ensure repair by HDR or homology-directed repair. After the cells have been transfected, you will want to split and dilute them for further enrichment. However, at this time, you will perform your first screen to check if any cells were edited and acquired the mutation. If using HRM, you will want to pool the cells, extract the DNA, prepare the reactions, and run on a thermocycler to determine the genotype. Next is to continue with enrichment and successfully identify cells with the wanted mutation by HRM analysis. Cells that are determined to be wild type can be removed from the study. You will want to only move forward with heterozygous and homozygous cells. Finally, after the cell line has been edited, you can send the final edited cells to sequencing to verify the edit. 
Using this method decreases upfront costs for screening early enrichments of the CRISPR derived clones and limits the amount of sequencing needed to screen your CRISPR clones. The novel genotyping assays use HRM to detect SNPs and indels for clinically relevant variants. Here you can see how the data analysis from these assays easily make clear what variation has been created. This is an advantage that might not be as clear using other methods of variant detection. In this case, the black melt curve is once again homozygous wild type, the red melt curve is homozygous mutant, and the blue melt curve is, heter is heterozygous. The next example today that I want to focus on is our pharmacogenetic offerings. Pharmacogenetics is the study of the relationship between genetic variations and how our body responds to medications. A genetic test can give important information about how a person's genetic variations may change that person's response to a drug and can suggest ways to change drug dose or choice to improve medical treatment for that person. Right now, many drugs are prescribed as though they work the same in all people. Sometimes the dose of the drug is adjusted depending on the age, size, or gender of the patient. However, because of genetic variation, not all people will respond to the same way to the same drug treatment. Pharmacogenetic testing gives insight into how an individual patient may respond to a drug. PharmGKB is a website that has over 621 related drugs related to pharmacogenetics and offers information on 476 drug labels. The drugs are labeled based on their testing recommendation, seen on this slide here, so anything from testing required, where the label states testing should be conducted using, uh, before using the drug, to informative PGX, where the label mentions a gene or potentially a protein that is involved in the metabolism or pharmacodynamics of the drug. Canon Biomedical offers over 90 genetic targets specific to pharmacogenetic research. On this slide, there are a few examples of those. You can see the targets, the variant type, and the specific drug interaction. Today, I want to focus on these three in particular, two CYP2C9 targets and one VKORC1 target. All of these targets interact with the drug warfarin. For some background, warfarin is one of the most widely prescribed anticoagulant drugs worldwide. It acts as an inhibitor to the VKORC1 receptor. 40% of dose variants could be explained by looking at genetic polymorphisms in the VKORC1 and the CYP2C9 genes, and lower doses are suggested for individuals with these types of mutations. In this section, I want to discuss a particular study that was recently published earlier this year from University of Florida. In the study, the lab compared three genotyping solutions for these three specific SNPs associated with warfarin metabolism. The researchers compared R novoleal genotyping assays, TACMAN's hydrolysis probe assays, and luciferase-based pyrosequencing by Kyogen. They looked at both blood and saliva samples and tested these three mutations. A mutation in the VKORC1 can cause warfarin resistance. A mutation in the CYP2C9 STAR2 will reduce metabolism by 30%. And a mutation in the STAR3 CYP2C9 reduces metabolism by 90%. This slide shows the genotyping data for the blood samples. The overall concordance was greater than 99%. There was one sample that was determined to be homozygous wild type for the VKORC1 gene by both the novial assay and the pyrosequencing me method. However, that same sample was actually undetermined by TACMAN. 
This slide shows the HRM melt curves for the three targets with blood samples. You can see that the variants are easily distinguishable. Again, the wild type is shown in black, the homozygous mutant is in red, and the heterozygous samples are in blue for all three SNPs. This slide shows the concordance in the saliva samples. Again, TACMAN failed to determine one of the samples. This time, however, it was a heterozygous CYP2C9 star 3 sample. The overall concordance in saliva was 100% with three methodologies. The slide looks similar to the blood sample, so as you can see, DNA extracted from blood and saliva will give similar results. Um, here you can see that the three genotypes are easily distinguishable. Overall, the researchers found that HRM analysis is a fast and cost-effective, reliable method to detect a wide range of mutations. And the comparison proved that nobel assays are reliable compared to the two common options. The last application I would like to discuss is our neuroscience targets, specifically the gene APOE and its relation to Alzheimer's disease. Canon Biomedical offers over 80 targets specific to neuroscience and associated neurological diseases. On this slide, you can see a handful of the targets we offer and the specific diseases they associate with, including our APOE targets related to Alzheimer's disease. For those of you that don't know, APOE is a gene that encodes for apolipoprotein E, which is responsible for maintaining cholesterol levels. Because of this, APOE is often associated with things like heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, but what it is most associated with is Alzheimer's disease. We offer two specific assays that help distinguish the APOE alleles, and there are three common APOE alleles, APOE 2, 3, and 4. APOE3 is the most common allele and is found in more than half the population and is considered to be the wild type. The two assays we offer detect SNPs in the APOE gene that cause an amino acid change based on the variation or mutation. For example, if you look at the chart, if a sample was wild type for both assays that we offer, that sample could be categorized as APOE3. If the sample was mutant for both, it could be categorized as APOE4. For some more background, everyone has two copies of a gene, and the combination determines your APOE genotype. The E2 allele is the rarest form of APOE with an allele frequency of approximately 8% in the general population and carrying even one copy appears to reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's by up to 40%. The APOE4 allele is present in approximately 10 to 15% of the general population, but 40% of people with Alzheimer's disease. This allele increases the risk for Alzheimer's and lowers the age of onset. And having one copy of E4, so for example, an E3, E4 genotype, can increase your risk by two to three times, while having two copies can increase your risk by 12. On this slide, you can see data um, derived from blood samples that were tested with one of our APOE assays. You can see that all three genotypes, wild type, homozygous mutant, and heterozygous, are easily distinguishable based on their melt curves. We understand that it's not always easy to obtain positive controls for un unique mutations. And because of this, Canon Biomedical has developed characterized genotyping controls for genotyping assays, including this APOE assay. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can now see that by, our, by using our novial controls, you can compare the sample curve data, which is seen in green and red, to the known cur 
uh, control curve data seen in blue. Before I conclude, I would like to quickly show you how you can find your target of interest today. This slide here breaks down the products that are offered in the Novil portfolio that I have discussed. I want to quickly mention that if you have your own primers and probes, you can pair them with our Novil Genotyping Master Mix and Oligo Dilution Buffer to implement the fast high-speed chemistry I spoke about today. The products are all shipped at ambient conditions, and the assays and master mix can be stored at 4 degrees Celsius. The controls should be stored at minus 20. Each assay offers 166 reactions for 10 microliter reactions. In the beginning of the presentation, I showed you a protocol that requires a HRM-capable thermocycler. Novial chemistry can be run on any HRM-capable thermocycler. However, we have tested and validated market-leading instruments found on this slide here. So you can see common instruments, maybe even those found in your own lab, such as BioRad, CFX 96 and 384, Roche's Light Cyclers, Thermo Fisher's Quant Studios, and Kyogen's Rotorgene Q platform. I have to apologize. I see this slide's a little blurry. Um, and you may not be able to make out everything. But if you are interested in seeing the type of targets we offer outside of the ones discussed in the presentation today, um, or if you want to learn more about the targets I discussed, you can visit our website at www.canon-biomedical.com. Um, here you can search for an assay by one of two methods. So you can search by research topic, which is seen on the left, so for example, you could choose neuroscience or pharmacogenetics. And then the other way you can search is by our assay database, which is seen here on the right, where you can type in a specific gene target, such as APOE, or even search by drug interaction, like warfarin or tamoxifen, for example. Once you choose a target to view, you can find the catalog number for the assay and the catalog number for the associated control at the top of the page, which you can see here in the red box, along with other specific information about the target, including example data curves if you scroll down the page. I mentioned this earlier, but we also offer free online software for HRM analysis. It is an intuitive, easy-to-use tool that allows you to visualize four different graphs from your HRM data, including melt curves, normalized curves, derivative curves, and difference plots. In addition, the tool allows you to auto-cluster your data based off of curve likeness. If you want to learn more, you can visit um, our virtual booth, or you can see a demo of the software online. To access the software, you can visit the website here, and which is software.canon-biomedical.com, and you can register to use. The software has a help page. The link is highlighted here in red. The help page is essentially a user guide and can help navigate the software and even offer sample files to play with and test. Before I get to questions, I would like to summarize by saying that I hope you can now see how HRM and Novial can help detect your toughest targets. HRM detects a variety of targets, including SNPs, indels, rare alleles, and mitochondrial DNA. And Novial delivers a bench-tested, simple protocol with rapid results that is cost-effective. It offers genotyping controls so you are not limited to sample number, and you can test as little as one sample at a time. I urge you to reach out today to see how Novial can, detect, can help detect your tough targets. Thank you so much for attending this session. We do have a virtual booth at this event, and if you are looking for literature or are interested in learning more, please visit. Are there any questions before I close today? 
Thank you, Dana, for that informative presentation. We appreciate it. And we now want to start with our live audience portion of Q&A for this webinar. If you have any questions, audience members, you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window. Type that question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So we do have some questions coming in already, Dana. Our first question is, is this offered as a service? So that's a great question that we often receive. Um, these assays are not offered as a, as a service through Canon Biomedical. They're sold as reagents to run in your own lab. Great, thank you. Our next question from our audience is, can you multiplex using these products? Another good question. So these assays use one dye, and so they are not multiplex capable. We do offer some assays that are multi-target, which means they're able to discriminate between more than one SNP or indel within the same gene. But again, um, all of our assays are single-plex. Thank you. And Dana, why would one want to use this technology versus something like Hydrolysis Probe PCR or maybe TACMEN? OK. Um, so Hydrolysis Probe PCR, which is also another targeted approach, um, often requires or actually does require a minimum of samples to form clusters and call the appropriate genotype. Um, our technology doesn't require a minimum, a minimum number of samples, so you don't have to rely on batching. Um, and then we also provide controls to help make that analysis even easier. Um, in addition, we have a number of unique targets, like our mitochondrial DNA targets that I talked about, but um, even some of our multi-target discrimination targets and our large deletion assays that do not have hydrolysis probe solutions um, available for similar targets. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you to our audience members. We have some great questions coming in. Our next question is two parts. What is the best sensitivity of HRM, and can I use HRM to detect somatic mutations? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, HRM is highly sensitive, and so in most studies, sensitivity can be anywhere from 98 to 100 percent. So top sensitivity is around 100 percent. That's often in one of those unlabeled probe assays, which I showed an example of. Um, and then you can use HRM to detect somatic mutations. There are many papers out there that use HRM to detect somatic mutations. However, all of the assays that we offer in our Novio library at Canon Biomedical are for inherited targets. Thank you for that. We have one more question from our audience. What if you don't have my target of interest? Right, so we offer um, over 350 different targets, um, but if we don't have your target of interest, um, we are currently expanding our portfolio. In fact, many of the assays that we develop um, come from researchers in the field looking for a simple and effective method to genotype their samples. Um, so depending on your target of interest, we could potentially customize a particular assay we would ask you to reach out, and we can have that discussion offline. And then in addition, um, I mentioned this towards the end of the presentation, but we do offer our Novial Chemistry in this sort of create your own assay format. So what you would do is you would buy the Novial Genotyping Master Mix and the dilution buffer, and then you could mix them with your own primers for the target that you're trying to genotype. I hope that answers um, your question. It does. Thank you so much, Dana. And I want to thank audience members for their questions. And please know that any questions further coming in after the presentation, Dana is happy to answer by email. Dana, did you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with our audience today? 
I just wanted to thank everyone for attending the presentation. I also wanted to mention that you can connect with us on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, we are Canon Biomedical. We post all of our new product announcements, even our press releases there. So if you want to keep up on the latest news of Canon Biomedical, we urge you to check us on those channels and connect with us. Thank you, Dana, and thank you again for your presentation. I also would like to thank Canon Biomedical and LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before I go, I want to let everyone in the audience know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through March of 2017. I'm sorry, 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who missed may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye, everyone.